you. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to kick off the data center session. And my talk is on carbon dependencies that we need to consider in data center design and management. First, I would like to thank my awesome colleagues who contributed to this work. And I also want to give a quick disclaimer before starting. And this work represents the initial findings of the research that's been done at FAIR. And it doesn't intend to reflect any of Meta's data center plans. All right. So sustainability solutions for data centers are independent. These solutions include design decisions and runtime decisions. Design decisions such as renewable investments or how much battery capacity, how much server capacity to install, where to site the data center location are highly interdependent with the runtime decisions such as workload management and battery discharge or discharge decisions. Currently, majority of the technology companies invest in renewables based on annual carbon matching or energy matching. But this is not sufficient because of the intermittent nature of renewables. We need complementary solutions such as energy storage or workload management that builds on top of renewables to improve the renewable energy utilization and to reduce the carbon footprint further. And these complementary solutions require fine-grained tracking, such as hourly on an hourly basis. So future of data sustainable data centers requires coordinated solutions with fine-grained measurements to reach carbon optimal solutions and to improve renewable utilization. And in my talk today, I'll talk about these three components, renewables, energy storage, and workload management. So before, before I get into details of these three components, I want to talk about the reason behind these, one of the major reasons behind these dependencies, which is the trade-off between embodied and operational footprint. We heard about these earlier throughout the days, but I want to reiterate that every sustainable solution that we implement we need to weigh the embodied footprint against the operational footprint gain we are having. And our goal should be to minimize the total of embodied footprint and operational footprint. All right, so let's start with the renewable solution first. So renewable energy characteristics are highly variable. And in this chart, you see three selected regions from Meta's data centers in the US, Oregon, North Carolina, and Utah. There are wind-only regions where there's no solar power, there are solar-only regions, and there are hybrid regions. So the renewable energy not only varies region to region, but as you also see in these images, it varies significantly from hour to hour. And it also varies day to day, and the last column here quantifies the variance over the year as a daily histogram. So, as Andrew also mentioned earlier in his talk today, this variability in renewable energy is causing curtailment problems. So, curtailment means we generate renewable energy, but we cannot use them, we cannot store them, or we cannot transmit them. So they essentially go wasted. And in this chart here shows the curtailed energy ratio to total energy in California's grid. Historically, as there are more renewables installed in the California grid, curtailments have increased. And last year, 6% of the renewable energy in the California grid was cur curtailed. but they also have embodied component. Building a solar farm takes 55 kilogram of CO2 per megawatt hour of energy generated. And for wind farms take 15 kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour of energy generated. 
they also have 25 to 30 years of lifetime. And when embodied carbon footprint is considered, operating at renewables at 24 seven may not be the carbon optimal way. And in fact, as a matter of the fact, it is not the carbon optimal solution. So let's move on to the next solution, energy storage that builds on renewables. So as the uh, efficiency of the battery technologies improved over time, lithium ion batteries become a common place to store the uh, renewable energy as a, at the large scale. So batteries can reduce data centers reliance on carbon intensive power sources and they can increase the renewable utilization by storing the bat, uh, energy surplus. But lithium ion batteries on the embodied side, they have 134 tons of manufacturing CO2 per megawatt hour of battery capacity. And they have 3000 of cycles of lifetime. Further, they have other environmental effects from the extraction of the materials and the disposal. So other considerations we need to have regarding batteries is that we need to decide the size and battery capacity. We need to decide the placement of the battery, which could be at the data center or at the grid. Placing at the data center gives more control to the data center operator, or placing at the grid might have more broader advantages for the grid. And if placed on the data center, we also need to coordinate charge and discharge decisions. So these are some of the dependencies and considerations we need to make regarding batteries. Next, let's, next, let's move on to the workload management solution. So any source of carbon aware workload management or demand response solution, we first need to understand the workload characteristics of the data centers. So in this chart, we see the temporal and spatial flexibility of some of the workloads of some of the services in Meta's data centers. So temporal flexibility here means the delaying the workloads across time or pre-computing the workloads. And the spatial flexibility means moving the workloads across different data centers, depending on the carbon intensity of the grid. This will come with data movement and replication costs. So some services that have great temporal flexibility are AI training workloads. Majority of them happen offline and they are long running jobs. We also quantified what is the delay tolerance of the whole Meta's data center fleet. And we found that about 20 to 30% of the workload can be categorized as delay tolerant with varying SLOs. And some examples of services that have spatial flexibility are stateless compute or real-time services. I also wanna give an example service more in detail. The plot here shows the resource breakdown of a production offline data processing service. And each of the workloads in this offline data processing service belongs to a tier. And tiers range from one hour to daily and some workloads do not have any SLO targets. And if you look at the resource breakdown, majority of them have you are daily have daily SLOs. So this provides a great flexibility in terms of time shifting. But this is only one service service. The data center is composed of multiple such services and each services have diverse SLO characteristics and different workload scheduling mechanisms. So as combined as a whole, it is not straightforward to make such scheduling as demand response solutions in production. So let's bring back our scale for workload management. So workload management, time shifting or space shifting can help use less carbon intensive power by scheduling the workloads in a smart way. But on the embodied side, this may require additional server capacity to allow headroom for workload shifting. 
This was mentioned by Andrew's talk earlier today too. And other workload management considerations we need to make is the demand response solutions require coordination with battery ch charge or discharge. And you don't have renewables, do you postpone your workloads or do you charge your batteries? Or do you charge, do you use from the battery? And this needs to be a scalable solution at the data center level. And some services may require special hardware such as AI training or video encoding and this might limit your flexibility as well. So I want to put this all together and propose a framework called Carbon Explorer. And the goal of Carbon Explorer is to evaluate solutions to make data centers operate on renewable energy. The framework has two inputs, operational and embodied. On the operational side, it takes hourly DC power demand and hourly renewable energy characteristics per region. And on the embodied side, it takes the manufacturing footprint of renewable farms, batteries, servers, and the lifetime information of these hardware. And it minimizes the operational plus embodied carbon, and the output of the framework includes runtime and design decisions. Runtime decisions include Time and, shift, time and space shifting workloads, changing compute, compute, this, uh, compute precision or charging or discharge, discharging of batteries and design decisions include how much renewables to install, how much battery capacity and server capacity to install. So we are actively working on building this framework. If you're interested in learning about more, check out our GitHub repository at Facebook research slash Carbon Explorer. And with that, I'll conclude my talk and happy to take questions. Any questions? Hey, thanks very much, super interesting. Um, I wonder if you can expand a little bit more on, on what Carbon Explorer does currently. Uh, we had. So just to give you a bit of context, we had this interesting question coming from Andrew actually in the last session about granularity of, of measurements and figuring out which workloads are shiftable and, and, and so forth. Um, it wasn't clear, it looked from the, from the slide a little bit like that Carbon Explorer's inputs are only the whole data center power consumption. Um, but it seems that there's quite a bit of work necessary to then map that to you know, the workloads and what to do with them. Um, is that a solved problem for you? Is that where the, where the real work starts? Yeah, um, that's, yes. <laughs> that's a great question. So currently our assumption is uh, we take the data center power usage as a total as an input and we assume a fixed fraction of flexible workloads um, that, is that, that is customizable. Let's say 20% of your data center is flexible to shift within a 24 hours. That's the, that's the current version of the framework. But we, uh, that's, as I mentioned, to make this more realistic, we are also looking at the different services across the Meta's data centers and to make this setup more realistic. And that's, that's actually where the challenge starts. Thank you. Uh, why don't we let Pratik set up? Any other questions for today? Yeah. Hey, um, very interesting talk, thank you. I have a question about the information that you have presented, especially about the curtailing of energy, but also in general, given that Facebook is a global corporate, how much did you focus on specifically on the energy market in the US versus the other countries and, you know? That's a great question. So majority of Meta's data centers are in the US, but we have data centers across Europe and Asia as well. The reason why we uh, focused on US in this study is because we need hourly uh, renewable supply data to do this such analyses. And in the US, EIA provides this data per region, per local grid on an hourly basis, but it wasn't easy to find this such, on, uh, such data on an hourly basis for other countries. I think earlier Google's talk mentioned to, to companies like Tomorrow provides this data worldwide, 
but they are not free. Uh, you need to pay to get access to that data. And there's no free resource where you can find this data for worldwide. That's why we limited the study for US. 